I'd like to welcome you to the midweek Bible study of the Mount Carmel Church. We would uh, just like to say thank you for watching and listening. It's been great as we've been able to uh, upload to Facebook and YouTube over the, the many months now since the uh, pandemic that took place and uh, how that we've used technology and continue our, continuing to develop technology to better serve and to better uh, put the gospel out to, to many. But we want to thank you for watching and listening tonight. We're going to continue our study for our Bible study tonight and actually probably finish up the book of Philippians tonight with this area of joy and hope in the middle of life. We're looking at this area at the end of, of the book of Philippians is talking about contentment. And we looked at, started to look at last week the first part of it and we'll finish it up tonight. So let's have a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we come to you tonight. We thank and praise you for this day. We thank and praise you for the many blessings that are bestowed upon us, Lord, many blessings that we have in our lives. We ask for continued guidance in our lives, in all that we do and all that we say. And Lord, as we come to you tonight, we just think of many that are dealing with health issues, many are that are that may be struggling with different things going on in their lives. We pray, Lord, that as a church, as Christians, as the body of believers, that we would be praying for those that we know uh, are uh, just struggling. And Lord, we just want to praise you that you know each and every situation out there. But help us as Christians to be prayer warriors for each other. We also thank you for all that you do for us, and Lord, how that you sent your Son to die on a cross for each and every one of us, Lord, and how that we can praise you for that. And Lord, we, we also want to lift up the unsaved, Lord, that do not know you. There's not a more important decision in their life that they will ever make other than whether they know you or have rejected you. And Lord, we just pray for that. We pray as as Christians, that we would be looking and thinking about our families, thinking about those loved ones around us that does not know you, because we're not assured of tomorrow. We don't know what the next hour may bring in our lives, but you do. And dear Lord, help us to be prepared for that time when you return. And dear Lord, how we can be prepared is by knowing you and having faith and trust in you and knowing you as our personal Savior. We thank you for being a gracious and merciful God. We also pray for our children and teenagers and young adults, Lord, that are in the school systems, and whether it be from elementary to high school to, to middle school to college, whatever it may be, trade school, Lord, we pray for that foundation that is in them. We pray that that foundation is standing on your word. And dear Lord, we just thank you that we can come to you and uh, you are there for us. But we pray for our time together tonight. I thank you for the, the, just the, the blessing that it has been. And we pray for each and every family that is watching, each and every person that is watching, Lord. That as we look at these times in our lives, which many times becomes a struggle, that we know that you are there for us. And one of the areas that we struggle with in our lives is just being content with where you have placed us. Well, we thank and praise you for all you do, and we just pray for our evening tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in the last part of the book of Philippians, Paul shares the secret of contentment. And just a little bit of review that we looked at last week. Remember that contentment has been praised more and practiced less than any other condition in life. I heard that statement once. Another person said it this way, all the world lives in two tents, either content or discontent. And so which tent do you live in, contentment or discontentment? Well, one of the greatest causes of a believer's lack of joy in their life is the lack of contentment. You know, Webster defines the word content as having the desires limited to that which one has. You know, those, those are wise words. We must learn to be content wherever we are, whatever state we are in. 
you know, some verses on contentment that we looked at last week, and I won't go back this week and look at them, but first, the first one was 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8. We looked also at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, and, and 1 Timothy, as I said, verse 6 of chapter 6. We looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, and then Luke 12, 15. We also went back to the, the Old Testament, to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 8. Then we looked at the New Testament, Romans chapter 12, verse 16, and Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And then John chapter 14, verse 8. And a couple last ones that we looked at last week was Luke chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. Then we flipped back to the Old Testament again to somebody that... Again, if anybody shouldn't have been content, it was Job. And we looked at Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Wouldn't we be interested if someone told you that, that they had discovered the secret of contentment and that they were willing to share the secret with you? Well, in this passage that we're looking at, verses 10 through 20, that's what Paul is talking about. So let me read this to you and... Just follow along if you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds in your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Ephrodites the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. You know, as we come to the end of our study of Paul's letter to the Philippians, we notice this declaration that he had discovered the secret of being content. And he was willing to share that secret with the Philippians and with us. You know, what is the secret that Paul is, is showing us to contentment? What did he discover? Well, Paul discovered that contentment comes from a trust, a trust in our spiritual realities rather than a focus on our physical circumstances. In other words, it comes from that trust and faith that we have in who Jesus Christ is in our lives and allowing him to lead in our lives. We're in our Bible study as we come to the end of Philippians. We want to see how important it is for us to keep our focus off the wrong things and keep our trust in the right things. So let's notice that Paul mentions two spiritual realities in which we must place our trust. And when we place our trust in those spiritual realities, he re the result is contentment. Last week we looked at the very first one. First of all, all contentment comes from putting our, fit, our trust in the unfailing power of God. You know, in verses 10 through 13, we see that, ending with that verse that, that many people memorize, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if you go back to verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul's life and ministry showed that very things he wanted the Philippians to learn. 
You know, Paul pointed to his own experiences and the things that he learned from the experiences. You know, we don't have time to go back and look at that list, but there is many things that Paul went through. You know, what Paul discovered is that contentment is something that has to be learned. It's not something that comes naturally or automatically in our lives. Paul had learned where true contentment is found. You know, the problem that most of us have is that we're, we keep looking for contentment in all the wrong places. The devil and the world teach us that contentment comes from the people you know. If we could just be with the right people and could just be part of the right social circles, then we would be content, right? And we are led to believe that contentment comes from the positions you hold. If we could just have the right job or hold a high position, then we would be content, right? Or possibly the biggest lie of all is contentment comes from the possessions that we have. If we just had enough money or, or just got to drive the nicest cars or live in an expensive house somewhere, then, then we would be content, right? Well, Paul had learned something far different from that. He had learned to be content regardless of who he was with or what position he held or what position he had. You know, Paul reported that there were times in his life and ministry when he had more than enough, and that there were other times when he was in need and went hungry. But regardless of his circumstances, good or bad, he had learned that he could do all things through Christ who gave him strength. That was his secret to contentment. Paul discovered that there was not a single situation he was called to face where Jesus was not with him and where Jesus was not enough. And if Jesus was with him always, then the Lord gave him the strength that he needed. Now Paul wrote about the peace that passes understanding because he had experienced it. You know, 11 or so years previously, Paul had sat in a Philippian jail cell, battered and bleeding, and yet he discovered the strength to sing praises to God, even in that situation. But the devil wants us to believe two lies. He wants us to believe that things make a person happy. And he wants us to believe that all we need is found within ourselves. Both of those things are false, and Paul had discovered the real source of contentment. Because Paul discovered that he was not self-sufficient, but that he could be Christ-sufficient. Paul learned that no matter what might be ahead, Jesus Christ was sufficient to carry him through it. Having trust in the unfailing power of God brings contentment. Well, tonight we want to look at the other thing that he points out in this passage. It's the second thing that we look at, and contentment comes from putting our trust in the unchanging promises of God. You know, his, it never changes. The promises that he shows us in God's word is there. It's not wrong. It's, it's always proven to be true. You know, the unchanging promises of God is that he will meet all our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, it's important that we understand that God doesn't promise to meet our greeds. And there's a big difference between our greeds which are our wants and our needs. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us not to worry about food and clothes because God knows that we need Him. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Turn back with me just for a few moments to Matthew chapter 6. And I'd like to read verses 28 through verse 32. Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 through verse 32. It says in verse 28, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first 
the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, Jesus concludes in that verse 33, again, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, how God will meet our needs is varied, but how, however God does it, whether through our work or from the gifts of others, it ultimately comes through and from God. You know, someone has said this, God gives every bird its food, but he doesn't throw the food in the nest. The Apostle Paul understood the Lord's provision, and he trusted that God would meet his needs. When the Lord gave him much, Paul was content, and when the Lord gave him little, Paul was content as well. Paul's attitude could be summed up in this quote, I am always content with what happens, for I know what God chooses is better than what I choose. You know, I'm wondering if any of us share that same type of attitude. It's not an easy one, but it's the right one. Can we receive the Lord's provision, whatever it is, and be content with the Lord and His provision? That is the secret to contentment. Trusting the Lord will give what I need and being satisfied with what He gives. Let's look at the advice about this matter that Paul wrote to Timothy, his son in faith. In the book of 1 Timothy, if you turn there, 1 Timothy, please look in the book of 1 Timothy here. And we want to look at verses, chapter 6, verses 6 and 8. We used this last week as, as we were looking here. But 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Now godliness was contentment, with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Now that's, that's right to the very stim simple truth, isn't it? We enter life with nothing, and we exit life with nothing. If our simple needs are met, food, clothing, and shelter, then we should be content. That's the opposite of more and better and faster. Unless I have the nicest and the newest, then I'm not a happy camper. The greatest gain is not getting everything a person could imagine. No, the greatest gain is godliness. It's that spiritual relationship with God. And contentment, being thankful and satisfied with who I am and what I have. You know, the, the book of Hebrews, the writer said this about contentment. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, I want to look at verses 5 and 6 of Hebrews chapter 13. It says, Let your conduct be with covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Did you notice that contentment has to do with relationship with God? Where that, that relationship is where we depend on His presence and His assistance in our lives. Let's just think for a minute about a few practical suggestions for becoming a more content person. First, I, I think it's refuse to compare yourself with others. Why is it that we tend to compare ourselves with others who have more than we have rather than less than we have? You know, one of the surest ways to make yourself miserable and discontent is to compare yourself with those who have more than you. You know, it's easy to find someone who has a bigger income or a bigger house or, or gets better grades or gets a big promotion or is better looking or is taller or thinner or better better in whatever it may be. It's very easy to find somebody like that. But we must stop the comparison game or we will be losers for sure. Second, love people the way they are and not as you would like them to be. We must love people as they are, are because trying to change them will only make everyone miserable. And the only way any of us are going to change and grow is if we are loved accepted and appreciated even in our imperfect state because we will not be reaching a perfect state in this world. 
Third, accept things as they are and not like you would like for them to be. You know, there are many things that we can't change and we have to learn to accept them. Wishing that something was different and refusing to be at peace with the way things are only makes us discontent. You know, ultimately, when we are not content with who we are, who others are, and how things are around us, then we are ultimately rejecting God and being critical of what God is doing or has done. You know, there's one final thing that I see in this passage that leads to contentment, and it is knowing that we are bringing glory to God. There is a great lesson or giving, a great lesson on giving that can be found towards the end of the book of Philippians. It would be shame for us to miss that powerful principle because the more content we are with what we have, the more money that can be freed up to give, which brings glory to God. Look at verse 18 with me. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Aphrodite the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Here Paul expressed his appreciation to the Philippian church for their financial gifts, which Paul believed were really gifts from God and to God. Let's notice some important truths about giving. First of all, giving affects the receiver. Paul needed the gifts from the Philippians and he greatly appreciated the gifts. It is a wonderful thing to receive a gift, isn't it? Especially when it is greatly needed gift. Second, giving affects the giver. In addition to being on the receiving end of things, you know, we've all, 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 all of us have also been on the giving end. It is, a, it is joy to give to others, to watch them be blessed by a gift. Notice the language that Paul uses in verses 16 and 17. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Now that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. You know, both Jesus and Paul talked about us storing up treasures in heaven by our giving on earth. And we see that in Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 24. And then again in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 19. When we give our account, when we give, our account is somehow credited by God. Third, giving affects the Lord. Paul noted that the Philippians' gifts were a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Our giving is a pleasing aroma to God. Our giving brings Him glory and pleasure. And how important that is in our lives. Giving can be one of the most rewarding things we can do. But if we're spending all our money trying to bring satisfaction to ourselves because we are so discontent, then we will have nothing left to give. So as we look at this passage, I want to just review in closing what we've learned over the past two weeks. The first thing, contentment comes from trusting in the spiritual resources of God rather than focusing on the physical circumstances of our lives. You know, regardless of the physical circumstances we face, we have the power of God and the promises of God and they give us great contentment, joy, and peace. And as we focus more on the spiritual and lessen our desire for the physical, then we will be more content with what we have. And we will have more to share and to give, which, we lead, which will lead to even more contentment, more satisfaction and joy for the journey. I pray as we, we think about this, the secret of contentment, as we see Paul pointing it out to the Philippian church, how that our contentment comes through our relationship with Christ. A relationship of, of meeting our needs, not, as I said, our greeds or our wants, but meeting our needs. He will meet all of our needs. Are you content in your life with where Christ has placed you? I pray that you are. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear me, Father, we thank you for our time together tonight, and I thank you for the book of Philippians. How do we see many things that we can apply to our lives? And as we get to the end of the chapter, Paul is pointing out, the importance of being content. 
to being content where you have placed us, being content with what you have in store for us, being content with where we are, because Lord, you meet all our you meet all of our needs. You know, as verse 13, Lord says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He strengthens me because as we, we see that, we have a better relationship with Him and understand that He is going to meet all of our needs and He is there for us no matter what our circumstances are. Lord, I, I pray tonight for that person that has been struggling with contentment in their lives, that they are, will be looking to You and allow You to work in their lives allow you to answer prayer in their lives. And Lord, we just thank you for this principle that we see in the last part of the book of Philippians, this whole area of contentment. Our contentment is found through you. We thank and praise you for all you do, and we just thank you for all that we're watching and listening, and dear Lord, we pray for each family. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening tonight, and I pray that in your life you relook at this area of being content. Because God has placed us right where we are, because that's where He wants us. Are you content with where you are? I pray that you are. I want to thank you for watching and listening tonight, tonight and may God bless.